Konnichiwa and hello everyone. This is Rich Chan Likes Tacos here. And today I will be reading an in real ghost story. It, uh, so it, the in real ghost story is called Our Forgotten Soul and the Costa Bower. And uh, I got this from an online website. Uh, the link will be in the description for this night. Um, so without any further delay, let's get started on this in real ghost story. Let's not beat around the bush. Some stories should not be told. In this case, I'm not telling it, just simply writing it. I'm not saying that it's going to be scary and sinister. It won't change the mind of any skeptic. It's just solidify their ideas and dogmas. But ha! I'm not here to change anyone's mind. I don't care if it's believed or not. <coughs> this is just one of the many things that happened to me. The story I'm about to write is, well, the focal point of all that happened. It's my burden, and I'm still waiting for it to finish. Or, to put it another way, for the end to arrive. I will, I will be ex it will be exciting to see what happens after it. Enjoy, please. 1992, a strange summer. I, I was just finished... I just finished primary school and heading for secondary school. I have by this time two encounters with the supernatural, and I was very interested in learning as much as I could about ghosts. So I set up a club called the Ghost Club slash Beasley Remains. Its occupants and membership were myself and my best, best friend, Jonathan O'Reilly, who has sadly now passed away. This was to be the first encounter. It is difficult to tell the story because of an age of innocence for him, and I was stolen after this. And it was stolen after this. Too much happened for it to have drastic effects. This day, day forgotten felt like it would never end. After breakfast, John, I'm showing his name for the rest of the story, and it went out. And I went about our business of collecting t clues to a case that we were working on. And it started with me a year previous. And if we uh, if we had have had success tonight, it surely would have been op an open and closed case. But when is anything that easy? <coughs> I'm not going to tell that story. I'll save it for another time. Maybe. So after go, going about collecting the clues, we saw a crow with a cross attaching it to the ground. It was a very disturbing image. The crow was on its back, wings extended, and a cross staked through the middle of its chest. It wasn't a clue to the case. We just found it on our travels. But it does need mentioning, because like I said, this day was the focal point of my experiences, and that crow was an omen of some kind. John and I headed back to his house and out to the backyard, where our clubhouse, his mother's shed, was located. We started putting together what we had collected, but came up with no definitive answer. Fed up at this stage of always coming to a dead end, I threw our findings on the ground and pressed myself into an armchair which we had taken from a skip days earlier. Undefeated, John sat next to me in his beanbag and suggested that we uh, head out for a walk. Not to look for anything, just walk. It was after all a nice day. A little overcast, but the sun came, came out nonetheless. John always wondered about the things I saw. was actually very jealous of my talent. Uh, he would always curry about how they would look and sound. Do I believe in evil ghosts? He never understood what why I thought that my two encounters already experienced were evil spirits. I didn't have an answer for him. All I could do, all I could ever tell him was, you know, how there are good and bad people. Well, why wouldn't there be good and bad ghosts too? Then I felt it suffocated hot, in fact, too. I started to choke on emptiness. I couldn't breathe. And as quick as I'd started, it stopped. You okay? 
John was staying besides me with a look of sheer fear on his face. Apparently, I'd, I'd started shaking and screaming. I don't remember doing either. I took a look at my surroundings to see if there was anything out of the ordinary. I was standing in the middle of a small, unused road. The fact of Martin Savage on my left, his fence bordering it, a seven-foot metal spiked garden and a disused cottage in front of me. Come on, sit down. John was at my side. The stern still on his face. I'm okay. I managed, yet my throat felt dry and scarred with heat. Let's take a look at the cottage over there. Could be fun. John didn't protest. Anything after my sudden attack was going to be a relief. We walked towards the cottage. It was like any other typical cottage, except its front door was boarded up and windows on the front were stained and boarded up also. Come on, there may be a way in over the other side, I said. I went around the side of the house and, in, and found footing allowing me to climb the side wall and, used a fa- and to use the factory fence as support on the way up. Once I got to the roof, John, not far behind me, I slid down to the edge and peered over. There was, there was a window slightly open just below me. Carefully, I let myself to the edge, over the edge of the roof. I didn't want to fall into nettles below or break anything. Once I was on the ground safely, I pushed the window open a bit more, just enough for John and I to enter through. Once inside, the words vice versa came to mind. In my room, we were, we were currently in, and there was a ceiling and no floor, and the other room had no ceiling and a floor. Uh, by no floor, I mean that we were walking along planks of wood on their edges, with one foot gaps between them, and we had to be careful when we stopped. It wasn't the most exciting place to be. The other room only had a fireplace, the front door, and two windows. The one facing... The factory was the only one laying light in the room, so he kicked back for a bit. I took my head into the fireplace and looked up the chimney. Surprise, surprise, it was dark and dirty. Hey Rob, look at this. Coming up from the fireplace, I walked over to where John was standing. There was a footprint, a small footprint. You could have encountered the toes of the was and blood. I looked at John in horror. He had blood on his hands. Do you think someone was killed? I said. John only shook his head. It actually just appeared in front of him. What? Apparently, John had been standing waiting for me to come out of the fireplace when he saw the footprint appear beside me. The blood, however, was a different story. When he had entered and I first got to the fireplace, John investigated the room. He didn't find a lot of blood dripping down from the top of the window besides the only door inside the cottage. He pressed his fingers into it, thinking that could have been crushed, but it's very different than the footprint appeared. Lift me up. I want to see where the blood is coming from. I put my back against the wall, joined my hands, and lifted John up so he could see up above the ceiling into the attic. No sooner was he up, he was back down. He jumped down from my hands, in fact, and took off for the window. Not being a fool, I followed example and ran through the front door knowing it would take John longer than I cared to wait and to get out of the house. Through all the excitement I didn't hear the footsteps hobble across the opposite of the ceiling. I did hear them fall to the floor where we were currently occupying and start to walk towards me. Without hesitation I kicked the bottom of the front door wide open and found myself great comeback three nails and I saw it all. The feeling from about 20 minutes before came back, but this time I could see it. I could see all the flames around in the house. The room I was staying in was perfect. There was people in a panic around me. Then I heard myself screaming at them. Then it was over. The vision had stopped. I clarified what had happened earlier. The footsteps had also stopped coming towards me back on the unused road. I waited to see John. It chilled me right to the bone. Then after.
After another minute or so, John came over the roof and slid down to the road, falling with a horrible crunch. I rushed over to him to see if he was okay. He was pale white. His eyes were unfocused, looking at me, but but through me. I picked I picked him up and started to bring him home. Nothing was broken, thankfully. He had a scrape or two, but that's it. All he could say, though, was, Grandpa, I need Grandpa. I brought him to Granddad's house and knocked on the door. When it was finally answered, John had come round a bit, regaining some of his color. His Granddad asked what was wrong as soon as I had John sitting down, so I told him everything. He was sitting in a small kitchen chair when I finished telling him, and next he was raising his hands to hit John. I placed myself between him and my friend and screamed at him for answers. Why was my mate all of a sudden mute? What had he seen? What, what, what? His grandfather told me that about 65 to 70 years ago, he and his sister, mother, and father lived in that house. I was shocked. What, what had happened, however, that his sister had just got a new dress and was dancing around the room admiring it. She was 16 and very beautiful, he said. But the tail end of the dress went into fire and she went up in flames really quickly. Needless to say, she died and that this is what I seen in my vision and what John had seen. I'm thankful that I didn't see what he saw. We left his granddad's house a few hours later. John had come back to reality and wouldn't speak of what he saw. All he said was, it's not finished, Rob. We went back to the house. I know crazy, right? And John said, I was to wait here. I was to wait in the middle of a pitch black road while he went into the house. I protested. He just said, wait here, please. So I waited. <coughs> Time went to pass very slow. I was nearing 11 o'clock at night and I was very hungry. And somewhere off in the distance I could hear hoof beats the sound of a carriage. I looked up and down the road and saw nothing except pitch black endings, yet the noise got louder and closer. I closed my eyes and started to breathe deeply. I remember the day and its events recalled them in my mind and opened my eyes. There in front of me was, were six black horses, a black carriage and a black rider. They stood out against the blackness around them. I could feel the breath of the horses and, and the gaze of the headless rider. I knew what it was at once, the Costa Bauer, the death coach. My time was up, I cried. The words came out of the silence and formed in my head, in. I started to step towards the coach when a girl slipped past me and sat inside the coach. I was amazed. It wasn't for me, It was a wit I was a witness. This doesn't happen. The coast of Bauer appears only to those who it's, who, who it's taking. I was on a different level of sight. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it in my own, with my own two eyes. Then it was God, and in its place was John. He looked at me knowing, Let, let's go, he said, when we went away from the house not to return. Later I asked John what he had seen. He didn't tell me about the girl, but he did say that I'm incredible. He had gone around the side of the house and felt sick. He vomited and then he came back towards where I was waiting and saw what he saw. He said uh, he saw a bright white around me and nothing else. He was unable to take his eyes off me. I guess that was a good thing, but otherwise he would have seen deaf servant. After this day, John and I saw each other less and less. We were in separate schools, but we talked until the day he died. Our bond unbroken by a rift that we couldn't speak of. I'm not sure that the coach of Bauer will be back this time for me. I believe that more than I believe in anything else, so I wait and enjoy every day I live. As for the white light, that's my aura. I'm content, I've been told. The house is still there, but there has been no residence. I like to walk every path now and then. It leads down to a nice old-fashioned mill. My second encounter happened there and an old train station. Sometimes I feel John walking this size as I travel down that unused scenic road, but he's the best of company. Now, uh, so that was the in real ghost story. Now, um, on the site, this was, this was posted January 31st, 2008. It takes place in 1992 and in Ireland. Well, thank you all uh, so much for watching. And until next time, 
Stay spooky.